when you told him you were going to do his biography, what was his reaction? Well, he said, fine. The, 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 the important part of that was that he had to agree in advance to give me access to all of his papers without any restrictions. He did that and never looked back. Yeah. He was, um, he'd been a, a partner at it. What was for that time in that city a large law firm in Richmond? Right. And he had, for many, many years, had young lawyers working for him. It was a relationship he found easy and knew how to manage. Okay. He wasn't involved in the litigation, he was certainly involved in its aftermath. Uh, okay. Because he was involved in the schools in Richmond and in the state of Virginia. Virginia um, uh, adopted massive resistance, mm -hmm. and uh, their position was that they would close the public schools rather than to integrate them. When the orders were given, that there were schools closed in uh, in Norfolk. Uh, and in Charlottesville, and maybe in a couple of other locations, uh, that was fairly brief, and, and some measure of sanity reasserted itself, and they were they were reopened. Powell was not on the inside of uh, uh, of, of those transactions. It's clear that just Powell was very much involved in trying to steer Virginia away from extreme reactions to Brown, mm -hmm. involved both as the head of the Richmond School Board and also involved as a member of the sort of inner circle of Virginia, uh, leading Virginians, sure. and trying to argue against the confrontational stance that was taken. I think I'm from the South. I don't think anyone uh, I think it's extremely difficult to recreate what people thought before Brown. Sure. Not long after Brown versus Board of Education, almost everyone agreed with it. Mm -hmm. It's not to say they agreed with everything in the whole sequence of cases. A lot of people got off the train when it came to busing, but not long after Brown, Enormously, I mean, among among educated people, enormously high uh, approval and agreement with it. Right. It's hard to reconstruct the world in which that wasn't true, and I think Justice Powell had that view as well. That he, that he, looking back, uh, that it just seemed like a, a very different world, right. and it was mm -hmm. it changed, changed very. Well, it changed too slowly for some, but it still changed rapidly. I know Justice Powell had actually turned down the invitation to become a justice uh, early on, first time through. Why was it? Um, well, he had two two reactions. One was that he was too old, yeah. and he was too worried about being a southerner. Mm -hmm. He'd seen Clement Hainsworth chewed up and spit out. Uh, Clement Hainsworth, because one, one of the great injustices was the pairing of Clement Hainsworth, who was an admirable, accomplished, intelligent gentleman, and G. Harold Carswell, who was, I think, none of those things. Right. Clement Hainsworth whatever his reputation is among people generally in my neck of the woods, he was revered. And um, he was a, a lamb to the slaughter in the Senate. Powell saw that and he thought he was from the South and he had been uh, in the Richmond School Board during desegregation. It would all just be too difficult and too, and too bloody. And he thought he was too old. Yeah. Ultimately, he changed his mind. He did. Anybody, was there an individual or something that persuaded him or circumstances? Richard Nixon. Huh? Ah. Okay. President told him it was his duty. He said, yes, sir. Okay. It's clear that Justice Rehnquist's nomination made Powell's life easy. Mm -hmm. That is, if anyone was going to draw up political opposition, it was Bill Rehnquist, uh, not Lewis Powell. And so it simplified 
what in an era of highly contested and difficult confirmations. It simplified Powell's life that he was paired with Rehnquist. Then appointed in October of 71 and took the position in January of 72. So he had been on the court for a relatively short time when I worked for him. Mm -hmm. And the major thing about Lewis Powell at that time was that he was new. And, right. and that he had been in private practice and that many areas of constitutional law that of course became familiar to him later were not so familiar to him at that time. The aspect of the Supreme Court that I found most surprising and I think most people would is how little interaction there was among the justices. Mm -hmm. They may have seen each other at lunch, but they were they did not in those in those days go from office to office or hang around. Uh, Justice Powell, I think he he got along with um, all of his colleagues. I think he had a particular affection for Potter Stewart. And he and Justice Stewart were, were personal friends uh, outside the court. He had known Stewart before he came to the court. Uh, I think later on he had a particular affection and closeness for Justice O'Connor. Mm -hmm. I don't think that on the Supreme Court you see a lot of action designed to maneuver the court into a position. That's a kind of that talk that happens outside the court. They really work as nine little law firms. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's not his relations with the other justices. It's his own mind. And his own mind was aimed toward uh, his own mind aimed toward consensus, toward practically workable solutions. He thought in terms of, of resolutions that everyone could live with because he thought they were more durable and healthier. Right. And that was, tr that was part of the secret of his great success as a lawyer. Right. And it was exactly the mindset he had about the Supreme Court. It wasn't an effort to bring this justice and that justice along. It was his instinct to find a pragmatic American solution. He was not an ideologically pronounced person. I would make a, I know the, the sequence between Jackson and, and Chief Justice Rehnquist and now Chief Justice Roberts, but on an intellectual matter in the role of the court, I might draw a line between Justice Jackson and the first the second Justice Harlan, mm -hmm. and Justice Stewart, and Justice Powell, and Justice O'Connor. That's a line of people who had commonality of approach. And it's easy to believe that if they'd all served together, they would have been, uh, they would have been a genuinely collaborative effort. What's the, what's the legacy? When you got done with this uh, book, uh, Lewis Powell Jr., and you had to you had interviews like this, people were talking to you about it, uh, and they asked the question, what was the legacy of uh, Justice Powell? Um, if you asked him, and on this point at least I, I agree with him, he would have said his most important decision was Bakke, because it's the decision in which his individual participation was most distinctive and most influential. Subject to criticism from both sides, but it's essentially the still solution this is we're living with 40 years later. Mm -hmm. And it's hard for me to believe that it would have been the same story without him. That's his biggest influence. And grew to be very close to him. I don't think that was unusual for his clerks. He was a, he was a uh, gracious, generous, uh, soft-spoken employer us. Um, but I enjoyed him quite a lot. It's hard for me to quite disentangle how I became very close with him afterwards. Um, it was a great day in my life when I met the man. It's yeah. given me a, uh, a lot of professional and personal pleasure.